Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. We're coming to you today from many different corners of the world to have an important and timely conversation about Black women's leadership in the global philanthropic sector. This conversation is hosted by Alliance Magazine and Atlantic Institute in partnership with Voice, Vision, Value, Black Women Leading in Philanthropy and the Atlantic Fellows Program. Thank you greatly to these partners for collaborating uh, with us to bring you this conversation today. I am Melanie Brown. I will be your moderator for today. I am based in Washington, DC, but actually dialing in from Barcelona, Spain today. Uh, I'm currently an interim deputy director at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and a senior Atlantic fellow at the London School of Economics. I am joined by Toya Randall, Senior Director from Casey Family Programs and Curator of Voice, Vision, Value based in the United States. Daniel Walker Palmore, Director of Friends Provident Foundation based in York, United Kingdom, and Moki Makora, Executive Director of a new donor collaborative, Africa No Filter, based in Johannes, Moki is based in Johannesburg, South Africa. With nearly 15 years in the field as an Atlantic Fellow in 2017 and 2018, I decided to focus on Black women's leadership in the sector. I knew that there was something unique about our leadership, something that changed when you lived life at the intersection of marginalized identities that made you uniquely positioned to lead. I interviewed for my work at the London School of Economics 25 Black women, self-identified Black women, leading in the philanthropic sector across seven different countries and discovered the following. Number one, that work for these women was personal and professional. You couldn't divide the two. Black women were positioning their leadership, both in terms of organizational goal attainment and community racial uplift. It was essential, secondly, to challenge the orthodoxies of philanthropy or those long held beliefs and practices about how things should be done. And the women felt that it was, it was their job, it was their duty to do this work inside of a racist, sexist, oppressive social order, that philanthropy had to be an act of resistance, not just an act of charity. And finally, what was perhaps most telling about my work was that this work really took an emotional and at times physical toll on these women. And I studied the concept of weathering to really understood what it meant to have to live at the intersection of marginalized identities and also feel a need to lead with those identities as an asset, not as a deficit. It was clear to me then in my studies, as I know it will be clear to you today, that these women were specializing in the holy impossible. And that brings us to our webinar today. Now more than ever, as the world faces a global pandemic, immense wealth inequality, a climate crisis, and reckonings on racial justice, Black women are uniquely positioned to lead philanthropy to be more responsive in a more just sector. This webinar will explore the power of Black women's leadership in philanthropy, what institutional philanthropy can learn from Black women, and why we need Black women's leadership in this field now more than ever. Before I turn it over to our panelists today to introduce themselves, just a few housekeeping items. Of course, use the chat function uh, to say hello to yourself, uh, excuse me, to say hello, introduce yourself uh, and your role, your organization, where you currently are located. You can also use this function throughout our conversation to post questions or comments for me or for the panelists. I'm sure that we will not get to everything, but we will certainly try our best and we're able to combine questions uh, that share similar themes. Also, we ask that you follow the conversation on social media. You can follow at Alliance Mag on Twitter, and you can also use the hashtag Black Women Phil, B-L-K-W-O-M-E-N-P-H-I-L. And then finally, uh, everyone today uh, that's joining today is entitled to a 20% discount on subscriptions to Alliance Magazine. We'll say a little bit more about that later, but it will include their special 
uh, 100th issue, which is being released in September. So you want to make sure that you don't uh, lose out on that. And there should be an offers button on the right hand side of your screen. So without further delay, let's get to our panelists for this exciting conversation today. First, we're going to hear from Toya Randall, who is Senior Director of Casey Family Programs and Catalyst and Curator of Voice, Vision, Value, Black Women Leading in Philanthropy. This is an initiative that centers the contributions of Black women in philanthropy, specifically in the United States. Voice, Vision, and Value has just completed research on the impact of Black women's leadership in philanthropy during COVID. Toya, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, and hello to everybody around the world. Thanks, Melanie, so much for inviting me to be part of this conversation with Moki and Danielle. And I'm excited to share the work um, that I'm doing to elevate the leadership impact of Black women across the philanthropic sector in the U.S. But before I begin, I want to acknowledge um, that August 2021 marks the 10th anniversary of Black Philanthropy Month, which was founded by um, Jacqueline Bouvier Copeland, a Black woman with a long, successful career in the U.S. And today, Black Philanthropy Month is now an international event celebrated across the diaspora. And it's critically important for me to acknowledge the leadership legacy of Black women like Jackie, who created the blueprint and pathway for me to be here with you today because they are the inspiration for Voice, Vision, Value. There are those who are no longer with us, and I want to pause to say their names uh, in this space because they are now um, transitioned over to, to be our ancestors. And that's Allison Brown, Lynn Walker Huntley, Deborah Holmes, Jean Fairfax, Leslie Lowe, Marta White, Gloria Smith, and Charmaine Chaplin. So when I launched Voice Vision Value in August 2020 as a digital narrative platform to uplift and document the accomplishments and contributions of Black women whose leadership presence and impact in the sector often go unnoticed, I did so with the support of a close and committed thought partnership of Black women um, across a broad network in the sector. And as we celebrate the one-year anniversary uh, of this work, um, I'm also celebrating my 20th anniversary in philanthropy, and this platform really is my contribution um, to the field as well as an offering of gratitude to Black women who I've watched over the course of the last 20 years really transform philanthropy um, to center racial equity and social justice as key indicators of philanthropic effectiveness. So today, Voice Vision Value sits at the intersection of those issues, and we've set out an agenda to, again, honor the legacy of Black women who transformed the field, um, to research the leadership contributions and the impact of the strategic efforts developed by and led by Black women, and to develop customized tools and curricula to address the professional barriers unique to our community of leaders, and lastly, to curate spaces that are safe and provide holistic, professional, and personal development um, that prioritize well being, promote strategic network building, and strengthen opportunities for pathways um, to advancement. So, thank you again, Melanie, for having me here today, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great, thank you, Toya. Next, we will hear from Danielle Walker Palmore, who is founding and current director of Friends Provident Foundation, an independent charity with an international reputation for innovative funding and investment practice, and uh, is really at the forefront of rethinking the role of philanthropic resources in the UK uh, through their accountability, transparency, equality rating system. Danielle, over to you. Thank you, Melanie, and thank you very much. I'm honored to, to be here. Um, Friends Provident Foundation um, is a relatively small UK-based um, foundation. Um, we call ourselves a capitalized charity. Um, we don't call ourselves a grant maker, um, nor particularly a philanthropy organization, but we discuss our impact in terms of all of our money, including our corpus, 
and how that is working to achieve our mission. So that is in terms of what it's doing in capital markets, as well as in a direct um, investment in uh, social enterprises and organizations that are working um, in the economy to uh, make it better. So we look at all of our money. Um, and that has a, a range of uh, complicated um, implications that perhaps we'll touch on. Um, our aim in terms of our mission is a fair and sustainable economy. So we very much recognize that we are part of the system we're trying to change. Um, and this fair and, and, and change in our economic system um, does require um, a completely new, um, but perhaps an evolution of our economic paradigm. So in terms of looking at the impossible, um, we're probably uh, at the forefront of trying to do that because I think um, the pandemic has shown that um, the current system does not work in terms of actually serving society uh, well. Um, so an economic system like that needs structural change. Um, and for us as Friends Provident Foundation, um, this is born from a deep awareness um, and excavation of the structural inequalities in our economy and in our society. And our view is you cannot redesign any system without an awareness of what is going wrong and why some people are not served by that system and served well. Um, otherwise, you just redesign the same inequalities in. And I think one of the things, going back to this whole idea of being part of the system we're trying to change, um, uh, we are designing currently with a range of foundations here in the UK, a look at philanthropy in the same way. We recognize philanthropy also has within it some structural inequalities, particularly in the UK, where boards are predominantly white, male and over 60, and it has been for generations. And as a recent article in Alliance uh, that I wrote um, indicates enough is enough. Um, we are designing a system which actually brings some public accountability to the practices of private foundations and looks very carefully at diversity, transparency and accountability across all of the operations of foundations because we are part of that system and we all have some things to learn and to do. So um, I think uh, being part of uh, philanthropy um, and funding as a whole really brings some insights. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Danielle. And next we will hear from Moki Makura, who is Executive Director of Africa No Filter, a donor collaborative supporting the development of nuanced and contemporary stories that shift stereotypical and harmful narratives within and about Africa. Moki, over to you. Great, thanks so much, Melanie, and great to be here. Um, so a little bit about Africa No Filter. We are an African-based funder. Um, we're a donor collaborative, even though all of our funders, ironically, are um, Western-based, so they're in the UK and the US. But we've been set up to shift the harmful, stereotypical narratives about, but equally within the continent. So we do that through four ways. One is that we invest in quite a lot of research because I think when you start talking about narrative and storytelling it could get quite nebulous so we want very much to be an evidence-based organization so we've been doing a lot of research around narrative um, around, we're polling people about what people's perceptions are of the continent um, within the continent um, and we've also got a bunch of academic fellows who are looking at various aspects um, and projects that link to narrative and storytelling on the continent. The other thing we do is we are a grant maker. We are one of the very few African-based um, grant makers and we do grant making to two um, sectors. One is to media because they are um, the carriers often of, of, of the stories about the continent and also to the creative sector to um, storytellers who, and, and I see our grant making as one that's really about catalyzing creativity on the continent, um, because I think in a lot of ways, arts and culture is seen as a nice to have or a luxury in a, on a continent that has a perception that's full of poverty and there's a lot of important structural work that needs to be done, but arts and, and culture is a critical um, 
part of, of the continent and it's critical to how we tell our stories. So that's something that we work on. Um, we also use our voice. So we write a lot and we talk a lot about um, narrative change and also specifically pointing out where we see examples of poor storytelling, of uncontextualized stories that really kind of feed the harmful narratives that we hear. Um, and the narratives being that you know Africa's broken because everybody wants to fix us that um, Africans lack agency to make the change and that we're totally dependent on external sources. So those are some of the narratives we're fighting, but I do have to say that things are changing. So it's not all doom and gloom. Um, and I think the fourth pillar of what we do is really around disruption. So we've got a couple of big projects um, which are really linked to changing um, the, the ecosystem of how things work that contribute to the narrative we see. So. Um, we're working on a global media index where we are going to be looking at the top um, sort of global um, outlets that cover Africa to look at what they cover, how they cover it, who's covering it. And it's more of a, I would say, a carrot approach than a stick approach because we're actually trying to highlight what an example of a good story on the continent, a good contextualized story that reflects the continent that I, I, I live in. Um, and then we've got another um, big project which is a story agency, a little bit like Reuters, but it's one that's focused on telling kind of feature sort of stories that sort of shape or, or influence how people see the continent. So let me stop there because that's what Africa the Filter does. Melanie, back to you. Yes, thank you, Loki. If we could get um, everyone, uh, all of our panelists back together, I'd love to open it up for uh, a dialogue, a reminder again to attendees, if you have questions uh, for me or for a specific panelist, uh, please uh, you utilize the, the chat function. So one of the themes that I noticed in your three different presentations was this idea of being a catalyst. And uh, Toya, that's actually in your title, a curator and catalyst. But um, I'm curious as to uh, and, and I open this up to, to anyone who, who would like to respond. Uh, what can institutional philanthropy learn from the way that, that you all are leading catalytic change in philanthropy today? Pick somebody, Melanie. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna pick Toya, since I called you out and said Catalyst is in your title. <laughs> um, each of you is catalyzing change. And I think in a sense of urgency, which is not what philanthropy is really known for. And so I'm curious, what, what could philanthropy really be learning uh, at, at a time, at least in the United States context, which seems quite a watershed moment for black women's leadership in the sector? Yeah, absolutely. This is a great question. Um, as you've indicated, in the U.S., um, professional philanthropy continues to experience a growing representation of people of color in positions of leadership, um, not just at the CEO and staffing sort of senior executive level, but also board of trustees. Um, and right now we have the largest number of black women CEOs in the sector than ever before in history. Um, Chicago alone has 10 black women CEOs of some of their largest foundations. Black women are also um, majority leader of philanthropic affinity groups, professional membership organizations and regional associations. So having our voice and representation in the field at this moment as you mentioned in your opening, um, as we are grappling with a new wave of COVID um, infections uh, through the Delta, Delta variant, economic inequality, and all of the other issues that that has brought to bear, as well as the racial, ongoing racial reckoning in the U.S. Um, Black women's unique perspective at the intersection of equity um, and race and gender and class uniquely positions us to address these issues. Um, and when we sort of step into these spaces, we're doing so not only for ourselves, but for our families and our communities. Um, and so we hold that leadership responsibility fully knowing the disproportionate right. impact of poverty and structural racism and uh, structural inequities. Um, and so we bring that to these spaces and we're using our positions of 
of influence and decision making and um, to, to drive structural change. And I think we're also moving the field away from a charity model um, and away from its paternalistic and extractive practices to a model that is more equitable, inclusive, and just. We're pushing philanthropy to consider how all of its resources can be mobilized to address these issues, not just its grant making budgets. You have black women leading some of the largest philanthropic organizations through a process of interrogating and investigating policies and practices as it relates to operations, as it relates to board recruitment and retention, as it relates to pay equity, as it relates to investment strategies. Um, and in the 20 years of my career, this, this, this movement of leadership and sort of opening up the conversation to center equity has built momentum. And so now we are at a moment where we're fully seeing the breadth and depth of um, what our leadership in, impact beholds. Can I just come in, Melanie? Because I think it's a really interesting question. I think Toya has given a really good in, uh, perspective from, from a US perspective. I have to say, I mean, when you said institutional philanthropy, I mean, it immediately sparked, sparked a thought. You know, institutions have a, a kind of number of different dimensions. So there's the formal dimension. I think Toya talked about kind of that situation in terms of the actual organizations who's running them, who's on their boards. Um, as I say, that you know, one of the things we're really interested in what we're calling the foundation uh, practice rating system is looking at, in some depth at that uh, across the sector. And I think it is a really important dimension. Um, and I have to say in the UK, uh, that is not the picture in terms of black women's influence. Um, and there's much work to be done on that in terms of perhaps holding a mirror up to the sector to be as a, much more aware of the situation. Um, but there's also the informal level, and that's really that operational level is what he was talking about, that kind of how we do things, what is normal practice. And I think the idea, the, the, one of the things I think Black women do bring is that we have to situate ourselves within a context. We're forced by being minorities um, within um, a society. Uh, which may or may not value our contributions, we have to place ourselves in analyses to say, this is where we are, this is where I sit. And I think that kind of groundedness and that kind of lack of, um, uh, we, well, we can't just kind of say, oh, I am just who I am. We are told by society who we are. So therefore there's an awareness really of the impact some ways of how we move through society and our impacts in, in terms of other people. And I think, that is to me a fundamental um, understanding. We cannot norm ourselves. We are not normed by society as like the baseline. We are not, we are considered the exception. And I think to be honest, you know, philanthropy needs to understand just because it's done things this way for a long time, doesn't mean it's normal or sensible or the best way of doing it. And I think one of the things we do bring perhaps is a critical um, perspective because we are forced by society to have one. Yeah, I think you, you make a great great point about us being seen as the exception. And I come with two sort of lenses. One is being an African woman, which on the scale of things on the ladder, you know, is at the bottom, right? There's black women and there is African women underneath that. So within a sort of Western context, which is where I used to work, I think African women are very much seen to be, you know, useful in terms of, optics when it needs to be because if you're working for an organization that works on the continent then you do want to bring the african into the room and if an african woman even better you know we're ticking a lot of boxes but i think in reality when it comes to decision making and, and leadership we, we're a long way away from that but the flip side of that for me is because i work on the continent now and the way where i see women is that i think philanthropy is still very much seen as women's work on the continent it is the, the men who are out there doing the hard work, earning the money. So it's the wives, you know, and it's the women who are sort of leading philanthropy. It, it's not a it's not a good or a bad thing, because I think sometimes you just need the opportunity to get in there and show people what you can do. Um, I, I just think it's, you know, where the money is and the role that women, you know, take in that sort of relationship dynamic the wealthy guy the entrepreneur is going out to earn the money and you're doing the nice thing and, and giving back so i think there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of 
making philanthropy more strategic. So it's seen in a way as a men's work. It's seen as important work equally as opposed to, oh, we can just put the, the, the nice pretty lady on it. Um, but yeah, so I think we're in two very different places. Um, and it, it would be great if African women, um, you know, could, could actually take this more seriously in a way, because I think if you are in the NGO sector, you're there, you're doing the work, but moving into leadership, you still have to fight your way, um, your way to get there. But I think that's a global problem for everybody else. Yeah. I mean, I'm really curious, Moki, about this whole women's work, men's work question. <laughs> it's really interesting. And I mean, one of the things that um, certainly in terms of I was talking about us thinking of ourselves as a capitalized charity. So we think about, you know, all of that money is the philanthropic money, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just like the nice the flower arranging bit, which is the grants, which is basically marginal. That's the income. Mm -hmm. We're giving away a part, teeny weeny part most likely of the actual amount of money. If, you know, there was a reconceptualization of philanthropy and, and what this job is about managing all that money, would that mm -hmm. be much more of a man's man's job? Because that's like, if you have, you know, 40 million, um, that's your, including that's your corpus. And then you kind of give away, you know, 1 million, fine. Mm -hmm. But if you thought of it as 40 billion, that's your job. That'd be much more important, wouldn't it? Yeah, but I think you need to look at where the continent is in the sort of, you know, I think if you look at the value chain of philanthropy, the philanthropy, I think we're very much at the early stages of it, right? So a lot of the philanthropists are still out there making the money. Right. A lot of the philanthropists in the US, and I don't want to speak for all of them, but, you know, some of them don't need to make the money. You know, some of them are not there anymore, so they can't make the money. But, you you're, you know, you've got very young philanthropic sector. So it's not at the stage where it is that strategic. It's not at the stage where the men can let go. And it is still male dominated, the sort of economic sector. They can't let go because they're still earning. And often you'll find the philanthropic sector is almost linked, intrinsically linked to the business. So often the philanthropy is somehow connected. Um, and in, in that case, regardless of the size of the amount being given away, it's not the right side of the coin. The, the, the better side of the coin is to be making the money. To be given it away is not the sexy part yet. That's very interesting and very different than a U.S. context. And I really wanted this from the beginning to be a global conversation because I, I firmly believe there's more that connects us than, than divides us. So, Toy, I'm, I'm interested in your take since, since we're both coming from the U.S. perspective, um, you know, just what your reaction is to, in many ways, these positions in philanthropy, they are the sexiest, right? That is what oftentimes... I was told when I first came to philanthropy 15 years ago that uh, this is where people come to die. And I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, and that was a badge of honor. Like I had arrived, right? Like I had worked my whole career, uh, even though I was 26. Um, and like, wow, look at you, you made it here already. But that's that's not what we're hearing from, from our colleagues. And so I'm just curious about, about your take on that. Yeah, so your your quote is you. This is where you come to die. When I first came to philanthropy, it was described as it's, it's a wonderful job with golden handcuffs because you will never want to leave. Um, so, you know, professional philanthropy. I think about it as a black woman who's been in who's been in the sector for twenty years. In the context of twenty twenty one, also marks the fiftieth anniversary of the Association of Black Foundation Executives. Um, so when APFI was started 50 years ago, the representation of, of Black women, it has seven founders, one of them is a woman, um, was there, there were not a lot of Black women. So we've got a 50 year sort of, you know, um, journey to get us to this point of representation and sort of positioning in, in the C-suite and other senior executive positions. So. Um, I think for us, we really are at a place where we can move resources across the myriad of um, themes that Danielle talked about. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, through APFI and the leadership of Black women, you know, the um, 
the, the, the space and conversation around um, the representation of man, investment managers of color um, really took off about, I would say seven, eight years ago. And now there is a complete sort of dialogue and space in the sector that's really looking at the lens of investment management and that other 95% of philanthropy, not just the 5% with an equity lens and resourcing and putting you know, technical assistance tools and evaluative tools in place to again interrogate and investigate how philanthropy is moving money through a racial equity lens for that largest percentage of its assets and resources. Um, so we are in a very different place, but the journey to get here um, has been 50 years in the making. So Moki, I'm gonna come to you because you talked about uh, in previous conversations, we've talked about how philanthropy is so new and, and nascent on the continent, especially African-led philanthropy. Mm -hmm. What are you doing now? What is the sector doing now so that you don't have to take 50 years like us in the US to, to get it right? And it's always what can the West, you know, what can the US or the UK teach Africa? And and that's the wrong way to look at it, right? So so what can Africa from what you see, and I and it's you know, comparing, I, I recognize that it sounds like I'm comparing a continent to a country, mm -hmm. and I'm not, I'm comparing a sector to a sector. Um, what what can we learn that, that we clearly in the U.S. context has taken us mm -hmm. even more than 50 years? Right. So, so let me answer the question in two ways, because I think th there's one aspect that the American way or the Western way or the rich nation way of doing philanthropy is spreading to Africa. It's the o it's it's the only type of philanthropy that we've come to recognize, even though we were doing it, but we didn't call it philanthropy. So when people talk about philanthropy, you think of how, you know, established foundations do it. So that's becoming the, the norm in Africa. People set up foundations and they want to do it like the way we've heard, you know, these other foundations have been doing it for years. Four foundations have been around for, you know, for hundreds of years. And there, there's a danger in that to your question, in that you're coming with practices that in, to a certain extent have proven to be ineffective over the period of time they've been doing it. And one of the things that I think that, you know, if African philanthropists are should do it the way that it resonates, it's actually the way we've been doing it. Now, you might call it charity because that's what we've been called. Oh, yeah, that's charity. It needs to be strategic philanthropy. But the point is that, the, you know, it starts with trying to figure out what is the problem we're trying to solve. And often with strategic philanthropy, as, as it's done in the West, you guys have identified the problem and you've come with the solution. And now you're implementing the solution, sometimes with our help, sometimes without. And I think the way we've been doing it is slightly different in that it's it, often it's about, you know, education, right? So occasionally you might build a school, you might send, I mean, I know so many people who send relatives and, you know, people in their family to school because that's the philanthropy that's needed rather than, oh, let's look at the, it, let's change policy to influence education. There is long-term strategic plays like that that need to be done. But is that the role for philanthropy or is that the role for government? So when, when I think about philanthropy in Africa and what I'd like to see, I'd love to see us start and continue to a certain extent, the shifting of that balance that we have the we, we know the problem, we have the solution, we have the money to fix it, which is what the Western way comes with, to you have a problem, come and tell me, what is your problem, how can I help? It's that philosophy of Ubuntu. And, you know, in the old days, when I say the old days, like a long time ago, I just remember when I was growing up, you know, if you were wealthy, wealthy individuals, who you would probably call philanthropists now, outside their office, you'd see long lines of people waiting to come and share, this is my problem, this is what I need help with. Now, if you can take that philosophy, that approach and institutionalize it, make it bigger, be able to scale it up, but it starts with the right premise that we're asking the problem from the person who needs the help. And that's what I'd love to see philanthropy continue and evolve into on the continent, because I think that's what we're already doing. And I'm just nervous that this whole, oh, we've got to be strategic in philanthropy, we need MLE, we need this, we need this. It's going to turn it into 
something that's recognizable for for Western audiences, because to be honest, a lot of the funding is still coming from there. That's I'm, so powerful. And I, Danielle, please join in. I, I'm, yeah, no, yeah. I was really interested in that because I was just thinking one of the things that, you know, I was listening to that model and going, yeah, but power, you know, what about the power issue there of just like essentially that person just doesn't, it holds the power. And that makes me, as a model, something I think we've learned in the UK is like philanthropy holding that the power of that money is 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 poisonous. You know, the, it, it, you know, I would say in terms of the experience we've certainly had, and I'm part of, you know, some of not necessarily us, um, but people who do much more kind of frontline. Um, uh, work and movement building are very much about trying to not be not ignore the fact that they've got power, but certainly work out how to spread it. So they're not people aren't having to, you know, articulate in language that they uh, approve of the problem. So I just really would love to hear more about like how that gets dealt with. I don't feel you know necessarily exporting a, a, a UK or US model is the, the answer, but like the power issue must be international and global. I mean, I, I mean, to be honest, I think the power issue is global, but it's how you handle it. You know, what I'm seeing now with, you know, a lot of um, Western foundations is there's conversations around shifting that dynamic or, or, or trying to sort of, you know, open it up and open up discussions around it. But, but, but the point is that at some point, somebody has to make a decision, right, as to where the money goes. And that's why you want more black women and people of color and people who have been in that position so that that balance of power is not so unbalanced. But I, I do think that it's gonna be difficult to wipe it out because at the end of the day, you know, I, I, and you know, it is the reality. If you do hold the money, no matter how benevolent you, you are, you have the power. It's how you use the power. And I would just add that there are examples, Tim Mokey's point, right, where because Black women's representation in the sector here in the U.S., the power shift is and the power sharing is on the table and new models and new strategies for how um, philanthropic organizations have a much more robust and deeply committed um, engagement strategy that centers community and brings community into the room and takes the room into community to develop strategies together and to ask these questions around. So this is what the data is telling us, mm -hmm. but where are the resource allocations that will be most impactful based, impactful based on your lived experience and expertise? Mm -hmm. um, and so those strategies are happening. It's happening in New Orleans through the Greater New Orleans Funders Network. Sharon Bush is doing it um, at Grand Victoria Foundation in Chicago. Our foundation, Casey Family Programs, literally just had a leadership retreat for the second year where we had our constituent partners on the planning committee for the retreat and in the room engaged in conversation and presenting and speaking to us about what power sharing means to them. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like? With very concrete examples of not walking into a room and the leaders of the foundation are at the head of the table right? Mm -hmm. Not walking into the room where you're at the front of the room and we're in the back of the room, but how do we create a table and create a space where our voices and our presence is balanced and equalized in ways that, that we can feel it and see it. And it also realizing that budgets are moral documents and where you add, where, where you are investing speaks to your true values as it relates to equity, as it relates to inclusion, as it relates to engagement. And these conversations and these um, sort of ways of rethinking and reimagining philanthropy um, are beginning to take hold in the U.S. to much credit, to the credit of, of many, many Black women. So I agree, Moki, what you're describing is where we now are in the sector 50 years later <laughs> in many respects. Right. I almost sort of see it as, you know, like I have a 16 year old son and, you know, when he was younger, I could tell him exactly what to do because I held the money. I held all the power. Now, if I carry on on that trajectory, he's going to either stab me or <laughs> disappear. So you've got to change the, the, the dynamic. I still have the power. I'm still his mother. But 
the way I, I'm more benevolent than that. I share power with him because that's how you get a result. And I think that's the same, you know, working on the continent. If you're like, okay, we're going to give you this and you've got to do this. We can see it doesn't really work because we'll do it up until the money stops. And then we'll go back to our old ways because we weren't really consulted. We weren't, it wasn't really the problem. We would have solved ourselves. So there's, you know, I think there's lots of different approaches, but I think that sort of sharing of power, one has to be able to give up or want to give up that power. And I think that's the key thing. Mm, I suppose one thing though, I would like to throw in and test your views on is that I, I wouldn't entirely have an equation between um, money and and power. It is a power, but it's not the power. Um, because we know communities, um, we can't do anything without the people we fund. We do nothing. We are, I mean, I always kind of think we're, we're, we're kind of quite stunted organizations, particularly in the UK, because we have much smaller sta staffs mm -hmm. than the, a lot of the U US foundations in terms of actually numbers of people so we actually you know mostly are not operational unless we work through other people and i suppose i'm and one of the things you know of having a really interesting conversation with a range of, of people we fund and some we don't about how we can actually create a much more healthy um funding environment and ecology where we actually can share information and um and share because there's all kinds of folks so they have knowledge they have you know we have some big global challenges we cannot solve as philanthropy with a matter of much money we've got even though you know people like melanie have got lots of money you know some of us don't you know and i, I think it's just you not know. personally of course <laughs> <laughs> people you know right. <laughs> <By> association <laughs> No, I was gonna say, I, I think you, you, you make a really um, good point because I think at the end of the day, we have to look at how we, we as, you know, people in philanthropy are leveraging the money because it's not that the money's gonna run out, but there isn't enough money to solve all the problems. So I know one of the things that we are doing is we're actually looking beyond the money and saying, what else can we do? How else can we add value? And we've done a series of focus groups with, you know, some of the creatives in our network. And to be honest, a lot of what they need is not what money can give because money is finite, right? I can give you a grant, it'll last you for a year or two years, but that's not going to keep you sustainable as an artist. It's not going to keep your media outlet in business. So we've realized it's an access to networks. That's what they want. It's opportunities to become sustainable. It's capacity building. You know, these are words in certain organizations, Melanie, I'm looking at you, apparently capacity building is a no, no. Um, but you know, it, what, something we actually discovered, which I thought was really interesting was that the University of YouTube is the most popular academic institution on the continent. That is where a lot of people learn. Um, so, you know, building the capacity through training is, is critical. And these are the kind of things that are beyond the money. But what I will say when you talk about, you know, money is not everything and, you know, we should, it's not necessarily all about the money. The money allows us to do those things. If we weren't a philanthropy, we wouldn't even be thinking about these things. So I'm just saying that the money opens the doors, it allows us to do these things. But yeah, it's not all about the money. So I, I am agreeing with you. Mm -hmm. One thing it also buys us is time to think. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm always aware of that. I, I, you know, when I, I often talk about when I first started in the field and, and the colleague said to me that in philanthropy, we, we have the, the time to dream, right? And that really combines the two things that you're saying. And, and I would add to that, not just the time to think and the opportunity to dream, but the time and the opportunity to mess up and try again. And we don't always give that to, to uh, our grantees. Um, what I what I want to shift to uh, is the personal impact. And we have just about 15 more minutes. Uh, if there are questions coming in, I'm going to tell the administrators that I cannot see them. Uh, and so if they are coming into the chat and any of the panelists can see them, and want to take them, um, but but my chat function has has paused if there are if there are questions that have come in. Uh, but my question to to each of the panelists individually, and Danielle, maybe we'll start with you. But this moment, uh, I find myself often saying, "And then COVID hit, and then COVID hit," uh, and and we also know that many things were going on before COVID. But this really is a moment where we will look back 
pre and post COVID, and, and if we get to post COVID, and and think about um, just the state of the world. And so, how do you balance carrying what feels like so much need in the midst of, um, you know, as you said, limited resources? Um, philanthropy can't do this alone. The the world is literally on fire. Uh, uh, and and so I'm just curious about. Because one thing I learned in my research for the black women that I interviewed is that the work is professionally taxing. It is personally taxing. It wears on the body, on the mind, on the spirit. And so I'm curious, not just self-care, which I think is important, um, but how do you balance the enormity of, of this moment and of this work that you are charged with leading? It's a big question and a, and a real, real challenge. And um, I was recently in a fantastic uh, retreat for uh, black women um, here in the UK. And I and one of the things it was called Exhale, which is such a great name. And one of the things was I realized I have been fueled by anger uh, for actually quite a while, right? Just I call, was calling it impatience, but I realized I was just angry, I, angry on a lot of levels. And angry, anger is, is an incredible fuel. Um, it does work as well. It gets you out of bed. It gets you down the street. It gets you doing things, you know, late at night or whatever. But it also can be really exhausting. And you kind of realize it's drained you and you just kind of have like nothing kind of left and and being fueled by anger for a long time um it, yeah it takes it takes it takes a toll and i suppose uh, you know obviously we all work with teams and working with people um i think what i've kind of learned is you know first of all is that anger needs ch channeling and being clear um about an outlet um and and just bottling it up is just the thing you uh, i personally can't do and i feel like I do kind of have lots of outlets for that. And I'm really conscious of what those are now in terms of physical things that I need. And, but also, um, you know, just uh, projects and work, which, which helps me direct, uh, and, and give an outlet to that, that anger. And I think, um, uh, there's a great phrase, uh, that, that Quakers use, which is being a gentle and angry people. And I think being a gentle and angry people, I'm not going to hit you in the head, but I am absolutely still angry and just re realize that. Um, is really important, but I suppose there are self care aspects and and there are also team care aspects um, that I think that I, I've learned over the last year and, and one of those is to be kind. Um, I'm kind I understand that you know system change is threatening. I understand that. I understand that okay I grew up in the States and you know, if someone says, you know, I grew up there and they said, oh, you know, the country you came from is, is you know, in, in a period of time is, is going to be speaking a language that I don't speak. I don't speak Spanish, right? If everyone said, you know, the majority language is going to be Spanish, I would feel threatened by that because I think that is my country. I would not be able to function as I have all this time because the U.S. Uh, privilege is English. So if that privilege was gone, I would find that deeply threatening and worrying and scary. And how would I function? I would worry about all that. I get it. But I am so I'm kind about that. But I understand that this is difficult. So understanding and kindness is important. I think being honest is also really clear. Say this, this is my position. This is kind of where I'm at. And being really clear about that and finding a way to be honest. Honesty is really hard too. That's hard work honesty. And I think um, that is the kind of work we need to be in, involved in, but also being direct. Um, and that's something I find really hard, as you can probably tell from this rambling answer, being really direct and saying, this is the way it is. Um, and this is the way it's going to have to be. And um, I'm sorry, you don't like it. <laughs> and, and I think all of those things are all, all really important. And um, they're about, you know, giving vent to that anger, but in constructive ways, which are socially useful. I think that to me feels like the work we've got to do. Yeah, maybe I can um, jump in there. Um, I think for me, in a way, what I've learned through this um, COVID period is that it's all the more important to just be faster and just be rapid, just be quick about the work that we're doing because 
the need is so great that, you know, I've tried to cut back on all our systems and just to make it as simple and easy to get the money out the door. That was, in fact, that was the thing I used to say, we need to get the money out the door. Um, it was like, it was hot money, it has to go out. Because the thing is, you know, COVID is not so much a health crisis on the continent, it's an economic crisis. Um, and so for us to be sitting on funds, because you haven't filled this in or that, it, it, it wasn't acceptable. That's what got me stressed. We actually formed a partnership with the Western Union and we opened up a Western Union account to get the money out. I can get you money in a day, two days, and I can give you cash if you don't have an account, because that's another thing. You assume that the system's all in place. And in Africa, they're not. We can give a grantee money who does not have a bank account. And the last thing that I think is really important that we need to be doing is that philanthropy was set up to take risk. That's what we always said. And now more than ever, it feels as if, you know, with all the m and and all the sort of we need to show impact, we're taking less and less risk. We're stepping back and further back. And I'm like, you know what? Our favorite phrase has been just do it. Let's just do it. Let's do it and then we'll measure afterwards because you can't front load everything to manage your risk. There isn't enough time. There's too much at stake. There's too many people who need. And if I go down tomorrow, I want people to say, you know what, you know, it was, we got money out of Africa Filter. We, in fact, something like 60, 70% of all our grantees are first time grantees. They've never ever received grants before. That figure makes me proud because I know we're doing something different. Um, you know, if they, you know, if they blow the money, then you know, maybe I'll be saying something different. But right now, I think that's what we're here for. I think we're here to take risk. And that's what COVID has really taught me. Just, you know, get it done. Get it out the door. Just do it. Gosh, Nike should hire me because I use their phrase all the time. <laughs> just do it. Just do it. Yeah, I agree with Moki. Um, and, and later this month, Voice Vision Value will be re releasing a report called Centering Ourselves that highlights all of the ways in which Black women sort of led the sector and continue to lead the sector through the various moments of crisis, right? Um, but particularly as it relates to COVID and the economic um, sort of inequities that it brought to bear. Um, Black women described activating decades worth of innovation and sort of fortitude gained through previous crisis moments, particularly Katrina. And so strategies related to getting dollars to community groups, getting dollars to community members directly, individuals who have been displaced as a, you know, who, who, who were not able to go to work or kids who were not able to go to school, right? There were these crisis management strategies that were developed and so we were ready to deploy and implement. And now the shift is to how do we sustain this model of trust-based philanthropy? How do we sustain the urgency that we were able to flip on a dime 18 months ago? We don't want to go back to the applications and the site visits and all the things that delayed and just exacerbated the ability of folk in community to respond to the urgency of needs that existed before COVID and will continue to exist. And in the area of self-care, that was one of the things that Black women are clear about as a leadership muscle that has to be developed and sustained because we can't sacrifice our own well-being, our mental health, our physical health for the work because the work is too important. And if we're not at the table, all the ways in which Moki and Danielle have described, having us at the table will change the game. We can't do that if we're not well. So wellness is definitely something that is being operationalized as a strategy in the sector um, going forward. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Uh, I have a final question. I'm going to pause and just see if there are any questions in the chat. Uh, I don't see any. Do you all see any questions or comments? There's quite a few comments, but um, I'm trying to, I was looking to see if there's anything in particular, because I think with some of its responses to um, things we've we've raised. I mean, one of the things was um, recognizing that um, some of the philanthropic dollars that are going out the, the, 
the door are not ours. <laughs> you know, they don't belong mm. to us as, um, uh, as philanthropists uh, or as managers. Um, there's I can one see here. one that says, can they talk about their experience mentoring young black women mm -hmm. or partnering with them? Yeah, I mean, I just quickly want to say that my the oldest person on my team is 35. There's, there are nine of us, seven of us are women. I love that. And my hottest people are under 26. I love that. So I'm trying. <laughs> Please, any other, I'm so sorry, my chat function has failed me, but any other comments or uh, anything else that you wanted to respond to? It sounds like there's probably a lot of US experience. I think um, from a UK perspective, um, it's really, I think one of the things I feel like I've, you know, I've been able to do to some degree is actually just saying, I see you, yes. you know, I see you here. Um, you are present and you are important and what you've got to say is important. Um, and um, yeah, I think actually looking for opportunities for older women, um, so I think I'm probably the oldest person on this panel, um, older women to connect. I just dye my women. hair. So do I, <laughs> but look, it's a I but, you know. <laughs> Don't let it so, fool you. <laughs> But, uh, you know, um, having that opportunity for us to connect is, is kind of absolutely invaluable and getting that across, um, that, that reinforcement. Um, and, and as you say, the, the, those new ideas and those new ways of looking at things and questioning, why the heck do we do that? It's a good question. Yeah, and I would just add that for folks who are looking for mentors, sponsorship, or to connect and build networks, just reach out and ask the question. You would be surprised how often folks like Melanie and Moki and Danielle and myself will respond and make time because we know what it's like to feel isolated or to be the only one in these spaces. Um, so don't hesitate, given all the various social media platforms where you can connect and identify with folks, to reach out and ask for a Zoom coffee or a Zoom you know, chat to just connect and um, broaden your network and, and, and broaden your um, being part of, of a community. And, and can I just ask this question on behalf of somebody, because I think it'd be a really good response for everyone to give. What advice would you give to a young African slash African-American woman interested in being part of this sector? So on, I would say, yeah, I, I would say there are, there are several fellowships um, that are available for individuals in the sector um, looking to, again, connect with folks and have these conversations one on one so that you're on the radar when positions become available. Join the Association of Black Foundation exec, executives. You, they have both individual and um, group memberships, as well as regional and international associations of grant makers, because a lot of job postings and opportunities to network and connect are made available through those forms. And, and I would say apply. I mean, I know that's such a easy uh, answer, but oftentimes we tell ourselves that things are not for us or that we don't have the experience yet. And, you know, there's some statistic where you know, men look so at no a job. white man ever. So <laughs> no white man ever, and they'll look at a job description and say, "Oh, I can do ten percent of okay. what is required of this job. I'm going to apply." And women, especially mm -hmm. women of color, we look at it and say, "Oh, I can only do ninety percent of what right. this job is. I right. can't apply." And so, it, you know, these jobs are very competitive, and so I don't want to ignore that. But sometimes it is putting ourselves out there and believing and knowing that we have something to offer. We are unique in our experiences that we can bring to bear to these jobs in a way that other people cannot. And so there is not one path to philanthropy. I, I don't know that anybody grows up and says, I want to work at a foundation. Uh, I don't know that that's the dream, um, but that, you know, exposing yourself to um, different experiences that again life experiences work experiences mm -hmm. community-based experiences is is really a powerful way to set yourself up as as unique and then find a mentor find someone on 
on the inside of, of these institutions that um, can can quite honestly pave the way for you because I don't want you to think that other people are getting in just on their merit solely. They're having folks pave the way for them as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, just two quick things for me. One is that we've got a, a uh, what you call it, when young internship um, program. And I was speaking to somebody on my team today and we're actually, we, the, one of the interns coming to the end of their term. And the person said to me that, you know what, I'm glad she's leaving because I asked her if she wanted to learn how to do this. And she said, mm, no, not really interested. And um, that was from an intern. And the other intern we have is amazing. She hands rolled up, wants to get in, just wants to learn. And I think that is what you want. You know, there are so many opportunities, particularly now when we're in this world of Zoom. You are in the US. You can intern, offer your expertise to an African NGO, an African, you know, philanthropy, get some hands on experience. And I think there is a lot out there. What I'm beginning to see, and this is showing my age, a lot of people who are a little bit, mm, don't want to do that, I want to do this, I want to do that. You want to do the sexy stuff. It doesn't work like that. Got to do the stuff that you may not want to do. That's how you learn. Um, I, I think that's the first thing. And the second thing for me is that, you know what, when, if people have reached out to me, when they're not for a direct job, because it's hard to get in for they're, they're, you know, certainly on the concept, there's no jobs, you know. What you, what you need to be asking for, what are the opportunities? Who should I be speaking to? How can I empower myself? You know, what courses should I be taking? Those are the kind of questions I feel are more, I can help you with rather than a job. You know, you know what the, the unemployment rates are here. I mean, for that, we've got a small team of nine. So, you know, I think sometimes people, I'm not saying don't ask for a job, but think about what can Emoki offer? You know, is it, can I have a session with her because she might actually change my thinking or help me? Just think about the non job things, just like we're trying to think about the non cash things we can, we can do with, with, you know, like how else can we leverage our expertise without sort of tapping into the thing that everybody wants? But yeah. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Moki, you're going to have to have the last word. Uh, we are over time. Uh, of course, there's never enough time for conversations as important as this. Thank you so much, Danielle, Moki, and Toya. Thank you to the Alliance team, uh, especially Anne-Marie and Elika. Thank you to our friends at Voice Vision Value and the Atlantic Institute. I want to specifically name out uh, Olivia at Voice Vision Value and uh, Evie at Atlantic Institute. And thank you all for being part of the Alliance uh, and its growing community. If you found this event helpful and engaging, don't forget to go to the offer section on the right of your screen to get a 20% uh, discount to, on uh, any Alliance subscription. Thank you so much for joining today. As it says in the chat, which did pop up for me, right, as we were wrapping up, uh, we are all active on Twitter. So hopefully you'll reach out to us, follow our work, um, and stay engaged uh, in, in the important work that we're, that we're doing to catalyze and disrupt and really bring about change in a sector where it is long overdue. So thank you, everyone, again, for your time. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you.